thanks for tuning in to episode three of Unlocked, live on Facebook and will be on YouTube from tomorrow morning. What is Unlocked? Well, we are a live online show designed to help unlock the UK from lockdown with can-do ideas from a can-do community. We cannot wait for the government or the authorities to get us out of that, this mess. It's up to us, ordinary people, experts, finding ideas, discussing and sharing. Over the past few weeks, we've discussed topics as device, as diverse as unlocking Leicester, the pubs and nighttime industry sector, um, also restaurants, barbers, unlocking free speech, and also comedy, which is being killed by political correctness. We have conversations outside of the remit of the mainstream media without fear of treading into areas considered mm, slightly awkward because that's the point of Unlocked. Tonight's show, it's six months on today when the World Health Organization declared coronavirus a global health emergency. So tonight, in tonight's episode of Unlocked, we're going to ask the big questions. How did the NHS perform facing its biggest peacetime challenge in its 72 year history? Did prioritization of COVID under lockdown create an unintended tsunami of other preventable deaths? Do masks work? We're having a poll right now. This is your show. Get involved. The poll is on Twitter. We're asking, do you back the compulsory wearing of face masks in the UK? At present, about two thirds are against it. A third are wholly compliant. And we are joined by some of the foremost experts from around the world. But don't forget, before I do that, get involved, get stuck in, add your comments. If you want to ask any of tonight's excellent guests, questions, just fire away and I'll get relayed to me live during the show and I can put them to our panel of experts. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first guest, Dr. John Lee, a former clinical professor of pathology at Hull York Medical School, later becoming the Rotherham NHS Foundation Trust's Director of Cancer Services. Hello, Dr. Lee, welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, sir. So, first question. Um, Dr. Lee, you have described the COVID-19 pandemic in the following terms. The whole COVID drama has really been a crisis of awareness of what viruses normally do, rather than a crisis caused by an abnormally lethal new bug. Now, this seems like an astonishing statement when you look at the numbers. To date, 45,961 registered deaths and in the UK and 301,000 inf infections. Do you still stand by that comment, sir? Well, I do. Um, I think that it, the, one of the, the other comments I made right at the beginning of the pandemic is that you can't understand any of the numbers at all without context. And the way that the numbers have been presented by uh, the mainstream media and by the government have been resolutely without context. So although 45,000 obviously is a horrible number of of deaths, you have to put it in the context of the number of deaths of people that would normally be occurring in the same period. And we're talking about you know, 1,600 deaths a week in England and Wales. Um, if, you if you look at the 27 years worth of data that's on the website of the Office of National Statistics, and you correct it for um, uh, population, which you need to do because the population has gone up by 20% over the last 27 years. But if you correct it for population on a year by year basis, are not uh, we're not first we're not second we're eighth this year is eighth of all cause mortality excess deaths so the point is we're within the envelope of what normally happens when there's a an epidemic whether it's flu or uh, these things that is this year eighth out of the last 27 so well within the envelope um, that have been registered because of the way we've been counting COVID and the way we've been, I, I believe, over-registering deaths as due to COVID, uh, when in fact they just ha happen to be tested for and happen to be present, uh, rather than being the main cause of death of that patient. Um, I think actually the deaths are, are fewer than, than it looks. And of course, probably half of the excess deaths are to do with the fact that we shut down the health service. So it's not looking to me like a great success. Um, you're a histopathologist or a cellular pathologist, so you, you basically examine the tissue of the deceased to analyse 
any changes caused by disease, which of course gives you a very clear prognosis. And am I correct in assuming that hasn't been able to happen during the crisis and therefore deaths perhaps through other causes um, have been actually aligned and, and attributed to COVID? Uh, yeah, if I could just say, I mean, pathologists, most of their work is actually to do with examining the tissues of the living. Uh, you know, every time you get a cancer diagnosis, every time a biopsy is taken, we, we look at that. So pathologists are mainly about treating the living. Um, unfortunately, because of what happened with COVID, um, the, the, in this country at least, the, the number of autopsies that were performed in the early phases of the epidemic when we had most deaths were, if anything, substantially below the level that are normally performed. Um, so I think we have lost an opportunity to really identify what was happening in severe cases of the disease early on. Um, Basically, a, a lot of the, so when I said about a crisis of awareness, what I mean is that by making this disease notifiable right at the beginning of the epidemic, and by looking at every positive diagnosis of this test, we, uh, of, this, of this disease, we've been dealing with this disease in a way that's different from any other viral infection. In a normal flu epidemic, in a normal flu ep season, we don't know how many people died the flu because we don't test for it all the time. It's estimated on the basis of you know, uh, statistical parameters that they use to, to estimate these things. But in this case, we've tried to actually watch every single case as it comes through. So even though the numbers seem large, in the context of what normally happens, they're not huge. Uh, but what's happened is that people have become aware of the numbers, have become very frightened of the numbers, uh, and it's caused a lot of reaction to the disease and to the way we deal with the disease and in society, which I believe has been very harmful, probably more harmful than the disease itself. So, okay, so, so how do you think we should count COVID deaths? And if we did it by, by your methodology, what do you think the real figures are for, for, the, for deaths in the UK? Well, it's, it's just about impossible to know now. Um, what we would normally do is to, in, in, in deaths is to identify the main cause of death, and that would be recorded as the main cause of death. You also record other things contribute to the, to the cause of death, so not a main cause of death. So, for example, if a patient has dementia, but they die of a chest infection, dementia would be the main cause of death, but uh, you know, the chest infection would be recorded under part two as contributory, you know, the terminal thing that happened to that patient. I think because of the hysteria and the worry about COVID, many people felt that they had to record every possible COVID death so that they couldn't be accused of missing one and so that the government couldn't be accused of a cover-up and that sort of thing. Um, and so I think that basically we've basically pushed it to the forefront in pretty much every case where it could be. I mean, it's not surprising is it, that the number of deaths over the same period of dementia, cancer, heart disease have gone down below their long-term average. That's because we've been counting them as COVID. So, you know, as I say, if you look at the all-cause mortality, which is the only thing we can be absolutely sure of, because a death's a death, um, this year is not first, it's eighth. So basically, unless you believe that the measures that have been taken, masks and social distancing and isolation, have really been keeping the virus at bay, and if we hadn't done those, we'd all be dying of the virus right now, unless you believe that, um, uh, then, then actually this isn't anything out of the usual. I must say, I don't believe it. I think that the measures that we've been taking have probably had very little effect on the uh, natural history of this viral spread, possibly slowed it down a little bit, but in five years' time or even in three years' time, we'll all be at the same end point, and the only difference between countries will be how much of an own goal they've caused by these dr draconian measures that we've taken without knowing whether they work. Wow, so are you saying that um, the UK's lockdown was largely ineffective? Well, I, I think it's very difficult to tell. I mean, it, you know, unless, unless you, well, there, there is evidence. For example, in New York at the height of its epidemic, 70% of new cases were caught from people that they were locked up with. Um, I mean, you know, basically, there's a, there's a rule in medicine, and it dates from Hippocrates, and it says, first, do no harm. And that's the most important principle in medicine. If you don't know that whether, what you're doing is better than doing nothing, you shouldn't do it. And there's a word in history for people who do things when they don't know whether they're better for, uh, you know, for their patients, and that's quacks and charlatans. Having good intentions isn't enough. In the Great Plague of 1665 in London, for example, the authorities of the day thought they were doing good by locking people in their houses to stop the disease spreading, when in fact what they did was ensure that all the families caught the, the disease of the plague. They killed all the cats and dogs because that, they thought cats and dogs were spreading the plague. They didn't know that, but they thought it was. So the point is, if you do things without knowing, you can cause harm. So for example, in the uh, issue of face masks that you mentioned, um, you know, you can wave your arms around and say, oh, well, it might help a little bit and it, you know, it's nice to people, but good intentions aren't enough. 
will forcing everybody to wear face masks actually cause people to come out from behind the sofa or will it actually stop people coming out from behind the sofa, prolong the agony and cause things to become worse. If we don't know, my argument is we shouldn't coerce it. By all means, encourage it if you want to. By all means, you know, explain the risks to people, explain the reasoning to people. But if we don't know, it shouldn't be coerced. I, I wonder what sort of society we're living in when government can arbitrarily enforce ritualistic behaviour on us. Well, very, very outspoken words and the sort of debate we really recommend here. I've got one final question for you, Dr. Lee, before I let you go. And that is you identified um, the COVID-19 de death count problem as early as March the 29th. Why has it taken Public Health England and the government three and a half months to get this problem recognised and tackled? Well, I, th I think it was a question of framing early on in the epidemic. I mean, we had... Um, what I regard as misinformation coming out from the World Health Organization. There was also misinformation coming out from China. Um, and I think the framing of this epidemic in the very early stages was, this is a horrible new virus. Everybody's going to die. We must leap in. We must treat very aggressively, very quickly. Um, it turns out none of those things were true. Uh, so I think it was because a narrative was started right early on in this, in this epidemic based on the unrepresentative television pictures that came over and the inaccurate narrative. Um, and that narrative, of course, once you start a narrative, it can be very difficult to stop it. You know, once people believe the sky is falling for whatever reason, it can be difficult to persuade them actually that it isn't falling. Um, you know, in ancient Egypt, the priests did rituals every morning for 3,000 years to make sure the sun still came up in the morning. I think we're in a sort of similar situation with COVID. People have felt the skies falling. They believe that the actions we've taken have had an effect without really much evidence that they have, I have to say, but they have believed that. And now they're frightened about stopping. Um, and of course, the public authorities, the government, the politicians, the public authorities need to stick to their narrative because they need to justify the really drastic actions they've taken and the direct harms that they've caused to people by taking these actions. So I don't expect actually to have any clarity from the public authorities or from the government ever really about this. Uh, it's going to be argued about forever. And, you know, I guess you're going to have to make up your own minds what you believe to be the truth, everybody. Well, Dr. John Lee, you've certainly got this debate kicked off to a rip-roaring start and straight away we've got feedback. James Todd on Facebook saying Dr. John Lee is speaking. Total common sense, what a refreshing change. So you've got some fans already on Facebook Live. Thank you for your time. I'd like to move on now, please, to tonight's second guest, Professor Carol Sakura, who joins us from his garden. I'm just admiring his fine, bountiful crop of tomatoes. I've got tomato envy there. Professor Sakura, of course, is the consultant cancer specialist and former chief of the cancer program at the World Health Organization. During the lockdown, has become known as the positive professor, amassing over 300,000 Twitter followers looking for some good news in dark times. Good evening, Professor Sakura. Good evening, Martin. Hello, sir. Now, as well as admiring your tomatoes, I've admired your, your tweets and your refreshing take on this. And the way you've um, use your specialist background in, in oncology and cancer um, to enter the COVID-19 debate, um, to speak up for what you call the forgotten patients, those who've been simply swept aside uh, by COVID-19 due to the very fact they're too afraid almost or unable to go into hospitals. You said um, that they, these dooms, doomsday predictions of 120,000 deaths over the winter could come true but not from the coronavirus, but from cancer, cardiac illness, and every other serious illness, illness that has been forgotten. And you've warned of a tsunami of such neglected patients. Do you still stand by those astonishing comments? Uh, I'm afraid so, Martin. And when we started, the NHS reacted fantastically to this. Nightingale hospitals, single-mindedness, management doctors working together. I've never seen that in 40 years as a consultant in the NHS. I've never seen people work together in such a collaborative way. They got the job done. Ventilators were there. We had an oversupply, if you remember. We involved industry, the car business, uh, to make ventilators. Oversupply, 8th of April came, peak of the ventilator requirement the following week. It passed as though it was clockwork. Everything was working well. It was very depressing, but it worked well. Some of my colleagues in oncology, I'm far too old, but some of my younger colleagues were taken to the intensive care unit to act as essentially respiratory physicians on ventilator units. Cancer treatment, 
sort of ground to a halt. Cancer diagnosis, completely ground to a halt. So every month you expect 30,000 new cancer patients. And people like John, John Lee, would be the pathologist that would diagnose those patients. 30,000 biopsies from somewhere in the body for some type of cancer. Okay, the commonest cancers are four, breast, lung, colon, and prostate, but there's lots of others. But the pathologist calls the tune. He or she makes the diagnosis of cancer. So what happened? Well, in the month of March, it was roughly about 20,000. In the month of April, there were almost no cancer patients, which is what you'd expect because there was no cold surgery going on. There were no biopsies. There was no endoscopy where you put tubes into the various orifices of the body. You couldn't get imaging done. MR and CT were shut except for COVID patients. Again, fair enough. But now we're nearly four months on and it's only just beginning. And even still, the endoscopy rate uh, is hopelessly low. Now, Italy and Wuhan in China and Navarro, which is a big cancer center in Lombardy in northern Italy, written up their experience. Not only did they carry on treating cancer patients, they also carried on diagnosing them. The other statistic I can tell you is that there have only been two-thirds of the normal number of heart attacks. We call it myocardial infarction in the business, clogging of a coronary artery, uh, and the normal treatment is emergency stenting. Go to a place, Tony Blair, if you remember, he was at Checkers. He came to Hammersmith because they thought it was an immediate stenting hospital. The local hospital in Aylesbury couldn't do it, so they brought him there. He turned out to have too much coffee and didn't require a stent. But where have the patients gone? Where have the cancer patients gone? They've not gone away. Where have the cardiac patients gone? Again, they've not gone away. What's happened is different for the two diseases. For cancer, they're coming, and they're going to come with a more advanced stage of cancer. In other words, the disease will have spread to lymph nodes, to other organs, will be more expensive to treat, more difficult to treat, and the outcome will be poorer for those patients. We won't know who they are, and we won't know who they are probably for several years, the people that are going to lose things, perhaps even their life, because of the delay. With cardiac, it's even more complex. Some of the patients have just sat at home, not, you know, had chest pain, not done anything about it, just been too scared to dial 999 or to go to an emergency room or to call their GP. What's going to happen there? They'll have had their, their infarction, the, the myocardium, the muscle of the heart will have been damaged irreversibly. And within a year or two, maybe even longer, they'll get cardiac failure. The muscle will become lax. It will be baggy. It won't be able to keep up with the pumping action needed as they get older. And they'll die in cardiac failure at a younger age than they would have died normally. It's going to take years before all these effects come to light. And then, of course, there's the unseen pathology out there, the mental health pathology that we can't understand. We can't measure it in the same way that you can measure cancer or cardiac arthritis, immobility, dementias, all the other diseases that go out there. And there's, the patients are still suffering. The NHS recovery has been pitifully slow. We call it NHS recovery. That's the strategy, but it has been slow. And Part of the reason is it's not the fault of our system. It's, it's the way in which the government scared everyone stupid. I mean, really, the slogan from that behavioral insight team in number 10 Downing Street, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives, such a powerful message, skillfully used. It's, it's, it's brainwashing. It really was brainwashing. Yeah. And we've not got out of it. The brainwashing hasn't stopped. And when you look at the ministers and their incompetence at making decisions, I mean, things like the Spanish quarantine. It just makes no sense, a lot of what they're doing. And they're doing it retrospectively on data. They're taking data, making a decision, and then using the data retrospectively to justify the decision, which is what they wanted to do. And it, it's, it's sort of unbelievable. It doesn't fill people with confidence. So I guess if I had chest pain tonight, would I dial 999 or would I take my chances of not bothering? I'd probably dial 999. That's the correct answer for everybody that has chest pain. Everybody that thinks they have a cancer symptom, get it sorted out. But when you look at the chaos in our government 
I mean, I, I agree, it's a bit unfair because these guys have not done any science in their lives. They're arts graduates, PPE graduates from Oxford, all the other soft options you do to be a politician. And they have no skill at making decisions of huge importance, much greater importance uh, since the World War II, I guess. And, and so we're sort of stuck with a, a level of sort of political incompetence, if you like. If you look at other countries, at least they've had stronger leadership. They've had a clear way through. The problem at the moment, we're not out of this. I don't believe there's going to be a second wave. I think that's the doomsters are saying there is. But I, if you look at the data, it's, it's the same wave coming through. There'll be pockets and it'll, it'll go up and down. Uh, and, but what we've got to do is get cancer treated, get heart disease treated, get mental health organized. And I, I think that's the challenge for us all in the NHS and not dealing with any more COVID. That's going to right itself now. Well, Professor Sakura, I mean, that's why we got you on this show. You're speaking absolute truth here, and it's going down very, very well amongst our viewers. Um, June Slater, who's a Facebook activist, big fan of the show, says that in her inbox, she's, she knows of 300 people whose cancer treatment has been completely suspended during this lockdown. Um, and other people here are saying they've had friends who've had heart attacks who are literally terrified of going to hospital in case they burden the NHS or in case they contract COVID. So that brings me to my, my next question. Has this fear, the fear of God that was put into patients by the government, has that fear been counterproductive? And actually, in the longer term, could it be more damaging than if people had carried on using hospitals in a more normal manner? I think so. The fear is peculiar to Britain. If you talk to people in other countries, look at the publications from other countries, they never had this fear. It was controlled in a much better way. And you know, there was something altruistic about protecting the NHS. It was for, not for you. It was for other people. You were protecting this church, of, uh, the, the new Church of England, the NHS. You were protecting it from, its, for, from destroying itself. And so it was, a, it was like a sacrifice. The message never changed. And when it did change, it was that useless one, stay alert. That's what my dog does when he's looking for cats. You know, he stays alert. But what are you alert for? You can't see the virus. And uh, I, I think that's been the problem. The, the Behavior Insight team, who have very powerful psychologists, and, uh, you know, in all wars, the psychops teams that try and study how they can, you know, from very crude things like dropping leaflets in Germany to say, we're going we're gonna to bomb the hell out of you to, uh, in World War II and the vice versa, to much more sophisticated brainwashing techniques. Surely the psychologists could have reversed this to get people to come back to use healthcare services. And I think that it, it, it's an age-related thing. So people until the age of 60, they're fine. They're going to go and push them. If they've got symptoms, they'll try and sort them out. Once they get to 70, they're less pushy and they, they, they sort of take the protect the NHS message more seriously and they don't come forward. And that's the age group we've got to target for cancer. So I think we do have a problem even now. It's coming up to August, unbelievably. And there's still only about two thirds of the number of cancer biopsies going on in the UK. Difficult to know, as John will know, the computer codes doesn't allow you to press a single button on the pathology computer and get all the cancer diagnoses out. You can get all the biopsies out, but not all the cancer ones. So uh, it's just a, that's the way the NHS computer systems work. So at the moment, many cancer services are running very light. People are standing there ready to receive, but they're going to come. They're going to come in September, I guess. There'll be a lot of patients and they'll need treatment. They'll all come at once. There'll be more chemotherapy needed, more radiotherapy needed. So it is going to be a challenge. We, we can overcome that bit, but we've got to get it moving again somehow. Okay, so I have two questions for you, Professor Sakura, before you go. I know you have another interview to run to. You're a man in demand. And obviously, the way you're speaking tonight explains that totally clearly. So the first one is this. Um, we've, we've outlined the problem, um, we're unlocked, how can we unlock this problem, this situation, and how do we return to a normal um, cancer therapy plan with full capacity? How do we do that? 
I think it's all psychology. We've got to get to the patients. We've got to get to the people. Uh, and that has to involve the politicians. I think the Behaviour Insight team at number 10, I saw on a video conference only two days ago, the chief executive sounded very sensible to me. If he got, it, he got us into this mess, that team got us into this, they can get us out. It's just using practical psychology to convince people of the need to do it. You know, all the cancer charities have tried. I've tried with my Twitter. And it, it's like it's falling on stone, stony ground. I think we do need to get much more powerful messages about use of the NHS. In the same way, the washing hands message is out there, which is a good message for COVID. It's a, it's a good preventive technique for public health. Let's get the same going. And I guess uh, the other thing is creating COVID-free zones. We've not put enough effort into testing. I mean, there's no doubt compared to other countries where, you know, I was visiting a cancer center in another country only this weekend. And, you know, I had to have a swab before they'd let me in and wait 12 hours in the hotel before I was allowed to go into the cancer center. It's reasonable to do that. The, there are better tests coming, faster tests, saliva tests, all these things. It'll help. But if this is going to be with us for a long period of time, for more than a few months, which I'm afraid I think it will, although it won't be so severe and we don't have any uh, the s seriousness of the deaths, I think we're going to have to go seriously to create COVID-free zones for surgical operations, for cancer treatment, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and other high-risk procedures, Martin. Okay, and finally, before you dash off, a question on masks. Where do you stand on the great mask debate? Currently, two-thirds of our viewers say they'd be against if they were being made compulsory. What's your position to mask or not to mask, Professor? That is the question. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I'm not very uh, subservient on the whole, but with the mask, I just bow to what people want. I go on the train to London, from to Marylebone, I wear a mask. I know about two-thirds of people are wearing, one-third are not. Maybe they're demonstrating their ability to break the law. Uh, it's, it's enforced very lightly. There were two burly policemen one morning. I saw I quickly made sure it was properly on, but no one, they didn't take any action for the guys that didn't have a mask on. It was, it's a very British thing. We don't like it, but we sort of obey. The protection of the mask is not for you. It's protect other people from you if you do happen to have an infection. And of course, if you've got a fever, you shouldn't ever be on a public transport anyway. You shouldn't be in private transport. You should be at home. You shouldn't go out. So it is difficult and I fully understand civil liberties and the need, we don't like people telling us what to do. But I think if you look at the WHO evidence, the evidence is there that masks do protect other people from getting your infection if you happen to be infected and happen to be asymptomatic, which 50% of people with COVID are. They don't have any symptoms at all. So they're out there through no fault of their own and they could be super spreaders. Very diplomatic ending to tonight's interview. <laughs> Professor Carol Krikora, thank you so much for coming on the show. They have to dash off now and enjoy those tomatoes and save some for me. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Sakura. Okay, wow. Wasn't that just astonishing stuff? People being brainwashed, political incompetence, arts graduates, politicians, the fear that is peculiar to Britain. There's a man who's, who's got an opinion and is not afraid to use it. So let's move on now to our next guest we have dr ellie cannon an old pal of mine a gp from london she writes a regular health column for the mail on sunday a sparring partner of mine on sky news and she she's no nonsense she talks straight hi dr ellie i'm good martin you didn't mention that you're mentioned in my first book as well so yes you are mentioned in my first book anonymously oh god was it about that night out we had Let's quickly move on talk to Ali. So you wrote, um, I thought, a really, really interesting article in the Mail on Sunday talking about what you call the silver lining in the pandemic cloud, and that is the use of technology and the way that GPs on the front line have almost been forced um, to modify and to revolutionise practice literally overnight. Mm. The headline raised a few eyebrows, and I know that writers don't write headlines as a journalist myself i'm often said what a terrible a provocative headline the headline was i never thought i'd say it but not being able to see patients in person has been good for them good for me and good for the nhs do you stand by that statement 
And I stand by it because I've been living it for the last four months. I work in the NHS. Um, I feel like I've been working in a different healthcare system to your last two guests, actually, because I had my own cancer screening today. Um, I've had two patients operated on for cancer last week within the NHS. So there is some... There's definitely some cancer stuff going on. Um, but yes, this is, this is what I'm living. I'm living this digital age of general practice in the space of one weekend. Uh, video remote consultations were introduced into general practice after five years of talking about it. Um, the will was there, the need was there. And of course, we all know necessity is the mother of invention. And overnight, we had moved to a completely online and phone system. Now I must point out, we still see patients. We see about 10% of people um, who want to speak to a doctor. We find about 10% converts into a face-to-face -face appointment, which is a decision made by you with your doctor on the phone, on text, on email, on video consult, and then you make the decision um, to see each other. But yes, a lot of people don't need to come into a GP surgery, whether there is a pandemic or not. And it was interesting, all the stats, mind-boggling stat in there. Um, before the lockdown, what was it, 71% of consultations were face-to-face, -face, and then literally overnight that was flipped. 71% are via Skype, via Zoom, remotely. And, you know, how's that been? Because how, how can you have that? that, that ha literally a hands-on relationship with the patient if you need to inspect them closely. I mean, as, as a non-medical professional myself, you think it couldn't be as, as thorough as having that face-to-face -face treatment. Yeah, so, so I think that's valid. So there's a couple of things to say about that. A lot of general practice now and a lot of, you know, that sort of interaction you'd have with your GP nowadays is very transactional, like in a lot of aspects of our life. You know, I've got eczema, I want my cream, I'm at work, I'm not allowed to leave to go to GP surgery, this is what I need. I'm not saying people don't want the relationships, but I'm just saying there's a lot of transactional stuff as well. A lot of people are accessing their own care. They just want a referral letter for physiotherapy or they want this sort of thing. So there's a lot of transactional stuff. So that type of transactional stuff we can easily deal with on email. You might want to email me at two in the morning, which is a good time for you. And then I email back when I'm in clinic. We can deal with it on text message, deal with it on the phone deal with on video. So a lot of it is transactional. Second of all, as I've said, we are actually seeing people. So you are actually, you know, examining. I have been critical myself of formats like Babylon, you know, people only having a digital GP. This is not only having a digital GP. This is a lot of the time just having a digital GP, but you can convert to actually seeing them. And then the other thing I would say is, Think of the world we live in now, whether it's the last four or five months, but also the last sort of even four or five years before that. We're now used to developing relationships in this way, like you and I are talking now. We are used to developing relationships like that. People develop relationships on social media. People develop relationships like this, WhatsApp, all of that sort of stuff. So it's a different way of having a relationship with a doctor. It's interesting, you obviously have friends in high places. Matt Hancock, the health secretary, announced today uh, that he's firmly in favour of this. Um, he wants a bureaucracy-busting push to offer patients more Zoom, Skype and WhatsApp consultations. But uh, there are a lot of com comments coming in quickly here. Um, and I must say, not all of them entirely complimentary. And, and certainly on the, on the Mail on Sunday piece, I mean, we all know, again, as journalists, Ellie, never read the comments. But some of the comments were basically saying, well, you're trying to cut costs. This is just about saving money. It's about lessening workload. It's about removing the, the really important humanitarian aspect, the face-to-face, -face, the bond, particularly in lonely, vulnerable, elderly mm. patients who want mm. that human contact. What do you say to that? Is, is this actually um, cost-saving, dressed up as modernization? Mm. No, no, and it, it, it's, it's such the obvious sort of low-hanging fruit to say. No, the point is that if all the digital tech-savvy people who just want a transactional consultation 
get sorted out on a text message or on the phone, what does that do? What am I then doing instead? I'm not playing golf. I'm going to visit my 85-year-old Mrs. Smith who can't get out of her house, followed by my 95-year-old Mr. Jones. I, we have got the time to do the other medicine properly and give back to those people the help that they need and the care that they need. And the other thing as well is you will be familiar with, I know you're a family man, everybody watching will be familiar with trying to make a GP appointment when your kid is ill or when you are ill. What do you do? You either hold on the phone for 40 minutes or you queue outside, or I don't know what people do. I don't even know how people make appointments. It was getting so crazy. Mine was one of the GP surgeries where they took a photo outside and it looked like people queuing for the Boxing Day sales outside, like trying to get an appointment. Now, so many people are able to make an appointment online or click through online that my poor old Mrs. Smith, who's 85, who does, isn't tech savvy, she can get through on the phone. So we're opening it up that you can text, someone else can go online, and the people who are not digitally enabled can get in their way. Just like if you and I order a pizza, I might go and pick it up having phoned a guy who I know, and you might order it on Deliveroo. It's like that. We can all do it in our own way, and it opens up the service to everybody. And I know that because that's what I have been living the last few months, and I have had the time, even during COVID, even wearing PPE, to spend the proper time with patients that I need to spend with because the more, not trivial, but the other things that can be transactional have been dealt with in a much more efficient way. Okay, I've got a question here. I don't know if it's an offer or, or just a simple question, but it's, would you yourself get on a plane to Spain? Would I myself get on a plane to Spain? Yes. My, uh, Currently, I mean, if I was offered to go on holiday, yes, but I wouldn't be able to quarantine for two weeks when I came back because I need to work. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, um, another question here from Para Shaw. How many patients have you seen face-to-face -face during the COVID lockdown? So face-to-face -face during the COVID lockdown, I work um, three days a week in an NHS surgery and on each day probably speak to between 20 and 30 patients and I see between four and five a day. I've diagnosed breast cancer in lockdown, womb cancer, I've had three children with appendicitis, I've diagnosed children who are underweight. I've seen kids who've got swollen limbs. I've done all sorts of things, seen all sorts of things, visited patients who are unwell, potentially COVID. So GPs are not lazy. I know that's a very sort of like tabloid attitude, bit Daily Mail, isn't it? A bit front page Daily Mail. Oh, we want to all play golf. I've never played golf. <laughs> okay, so um, you're, you're obviously a, a glass half full person when it comes to the opportunities afforded by technology and how the, the lockdown has kind of forced us into modernization. Um, you're obviously also a huge um, advocate for the wearing of masks very early on. You had videos of how to make masks, you were mm. on daytime TV telling everybody it was a sensible thing to do. Um, we've heard from um, Professor Sakura that it's a sensible thing to do for other people, very diplomatic, I felt. Um, some of the earlier um, evidence from the WHO itself as early as, as early as March was saying that they have no effect. So what's your position on, on, on masks? If, and is there any proven effectiveness that they actually do something? Uh, well, my position originally, so April the 19th, I publicly said that I think we should be wearing masks. Um, having said earlier on, six weeks earlier, that we shouldn't, because that's what we'd all been told to say by the Department of Health, definitely. Um, and I think that was from fear of uh, PPE usage. Um, actually, the movement to wear masks came from a data scientist in America rather than um, anything else, purely on the basis of data and numbers. And neighbouring countries, for example, in Europe, so looking at very, very sort of similar demographic countries like Czech Republic and Austria, neighbouring countries where one introduced masks and one didn't, and there's clear differences, you know, when masks are introduced in a drop in the number of cases. Um, I think it's an easy win. I think compared to um, something like a friend of mine who is shielding for 12 weeks in his bedroom, not even able to see his family, 
Um, it's a very simple thing to do. I think we're massively now overthinking it. Um, I think people should get over it and put a mask on. And there is science there. There isn't really science to say we should cough into our elbow, but we're all doing that. Um, so I just think we just need to get on with it, really. It's, it's going to, it can only help us open up. All I want, one of the things I agreed with that Carol Sakura just said was that also I don't really believe there's going to be any sort of second wave, which I've also written about. I think that, you know, we could, with all the different measures in place, actually prevent that. And part of that is going to be just putting a mask on. We all want this to be over. Who cares if you have to put a mask on when you go into uh, boots? It really doesn't matter. Fabulous. Well, it's great to see you um, agreeing with Professor Sakura. It's, 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 a, it's a beautiful thing to see that Unlocked is being a, a, a matchmaker of opinions like this. Dr. A, you'll have to let me know privately, of course, please, um, in what capacity I appeared in your book. Um, let's not do that over here. Um, my wife might watch this back at a later time. Dr. Ali Cannon, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having you on. Thank you. Okay, moving swiftly on now. Um, from continental Europe, Dr. Tom Jefferson, are you there, Dr. Jefferson? Can you hear me? We can. There you are, sir. Thanks for joining us. I know, you've had, I know you've had a very, very long day. Tom Jefferson, an epidemiologist from the University welcome. of Oxford. You've been up since four o'clock. You want to get this over and done with and get to bed. And thank you so much for your time. It's, it's a real pleasure. So thank let's you. kick off with the question I've been asking everybody tonight. We're running a Twitter poll at the moment. Two thirds are against the compulsory wearing of masks. So, Dr. Jefferson, to mask or not to mask? I know you base your opinions on evidence. So what evidence is there that masks are effective in stopping COVID-19 in the real world? Uh, just a word of background first before we go into answering a question. Um, I'm part of an organization which looks at av available evidence uh, and synthesizes it. And we've been doing that on physical interventions, not just masks, things like hand washing and barriers and distancing, since 2017. And we have just finished the fourth update of this review. Uh, unfortunately, um, there isn't uh, at present any evidence that masks uh, make any difference. Uh, that, of course, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's the first point I would make. The second point is that uh, up until at the beginning of the COVID story, uh, the total number of people who were in these trials over uh, the space of about 15 years is 19,000, which is a very, very, very small number if you consider the, the, the dimension of the intervention. And the third element is that the studies were carried out outbreaks, not COVID-19. So they were in uh, uh, influenza seasons, influenza-like other seasons, and some of them in SARS-1. So there's the question of whether the evidence or lack of evidence is applicable to this uh, uh, this pandemic and that, that's that's a almost impossible question to ask so i think i've answered your question at present we don't have uh, any evidence okay so the the obvious reply to that would be if there isn't any evidence that masks actually prevent contagion then why have they been introduced what is actually driving government policy uh i think you need to ask government that i don't think you need to ask tom jefferson uh, from uh, Italy, uh, that particular question. Uh, I don't think it's a question. Like I, I, I don't think I can, I can answer that question. Okay. So is it because the government fear a second spike, as per Matt Hancock's speech about a second that, wave emerging in Europe? And are you seeing uh, evidence of a second spike across Europe, right. especially in Italy, where you are now? Right. Let's be clear about this business of the second uh, Wave is a term I will use now and no longer. The term wave is a wrong analogy because in a pandemic things happen in chaos as you can see. 
And if you go to the, to, to the seaside and you watch waves, you can see them coming. And waves are a, a single wall about to hit you in between troughs. Uh, so waves is the wrong analogy, visual analogy, and it's a very, very misleading term. Also, the history of so-called waves is grounded on influenza, uh, or our interpretation of what went on with influenza pandemics, especially the famous Spanish influenza of 1918. And that in itself is highly problematic because of the military censorship uh, that was active, uh, during 1918 and 1919. May I just remind you that when the first uh, uh, cases of 1918 appeared of the Spanish, so-called Spanish influenza, this was in the spring of 1918. And any historian will tell you that there was a huge amount of uh, movement on the Western Front and large numbers of people being ferried over from uh, the US of A young guys, uh, soldiers. Uh, Spanish flu, the term itself, is a very good indi indication of that because Spanish flu is nothing of the kind. It wasn't Spanish. The thing was that Spain was not in the war. Therefore, Spain had no censorship. And all these cases appear to come from Spain and they actually didn't. They were probably all over the globe. So um, it seems to be when we listen to politicians, um, the, the fear of the second wave, second spike, call it what you will in September, uh, this sense of impending doom and fear when the weather changes, when we head towards October. Um, a lot of people are still really, really scared about that. Do you believe that the, a second wave or um, the coronavirus is actually the greatest threat to human life that we face now, which is what the press tell us more or less every day? I had a problem this morning. I had a break in in my house and they stole my crystal ball. Uh, and I, I really, without my crystal ball, I can't answer your question. On another side, I would say that fear is a very powerful weapon and it is the way we are controlled. You control somebody with fear or whole populations with fear. The trouble is, of course, that once that fear takes hold, then it's going to be a, a tough job to turn that battleship around. I mean, you well, still have people now that are scared to leave their homes. Fear and panic are contagious. Mm. Uh, just read the, the story of the black hole of Calcutta, where people died of suffocation simply because it was a, a, it was a, a very restricted space and fear and panic uh, just overtook them. It is contagious. So if you look at the evidence, and you're an evidence-based individual, um, you've talked about the evidence around masks, with all the evidence at your fingertips, what do you think we should be doing? Should we just be getting back out there to work? Should we return to normal? What's the route forward? Well, what's happening now, uh, at least in this country, is that we have um, very localised outbreaks. Uh, Meatpacking factories, couriers, uh, these are very localized outbreaks. There are hardly any deaths, very few admissions. Um, and so one has to answer, one has to answer the question, why is this happening? And uh, there could be a variety of reasons. Uh, the tests being used to diagnose positives and um, maybe the contact and the uh, uh, oral fecal transmission of the agent um, SARS-CoV-2, which is uh, one of the ways that this agent transmits. It's just, just droplets. It's oral fecal as well. And uh, this is, um, these are very, very small outbreaks. I call it Singapore-like transmission because this is what they witnessed in Singapore in February, March in dormitories. Uh, very few deaths and very few people are, who, who are sick, really sick, thankfully, uh, and deaths have gone right down. Interesting how Spanish flu um, had its name. Donald Trump likes to call COVID-19 the Chinese flu, but you've written, haven't you, um, about evidence that COVID-19 may actually have predated the Wuhan region and may have been around before and it may not even um, originated in, in China at all. 
Well, I, I have no idea where it originated from. This is, I've been extensively misquoted. What I said to the people who interviewed me is that I'd never met this fella in the street, and I, I hope I never, I never will meet him. But if I do meet him, I will ask him where he comes from. But it, to me, where he comes from is completely relevant because it's, it, it is a, it's, a, it's a political thing. What we've got to understand is what the ecology of these viruses is and how they originate and how they jump the species. Now, uh, let's go to this business of uh, pre-existing, uh, the, the, the virus pre-existing uh, the Wuhan strike, if you want to call it that. The evidence comes from sewage. Uh, and from frozen samples of sewage going back to at least March 2019. The um, study I'm referring to is Barcelona, so Spain, uh, and there's another study from Brazil, and then there's another study from France, there's another study from Italy. And these, they either predate or slightly predate the uh, obvious uh, signs of this, which is the clinical symptoms. Uh, the, the, the frozen samples were positive. Uh, but, and here comes the, uh, the really difficult bit, I think, for your viewers. The test that's being used is uh, something called PCR. You probably covered it in your program. And PCR is not able to tell you when you were infected. It is not able to tell you where uh, you were infected and it's not able to tell you whether you are infectious. It's probably able to pick up minute fragments of genetic material from viruses, not complete viruses. So we think that this may have uh, been around for a while, but PCR itself is not a proof of infectivity. And this is something that your viewers need to be uh, very well aware of. Well, Dr. Tom Jefferson, I mean, you're, you're a straight shooter. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I know it's been a long day for you. Um, speaking again, there isn't any hard evidence that masks make any difference. Fear is the greatest way of controlling a population, and you totally reject the analogy of a second wave. I mean, amazing stuff. Thank you so much for your time. Now, I'd like to move on to our final guest this evening, Dr. Wakir Rashid. Uh, welcome to Unlocked, a consultant neurologist with the NHS. Dr. Rashid, can you tell me um, about the types of patients that you see and how many you're seeing now versus before the lockdown? Okay, um, thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Um, this was uh, one of the real motivations actually for me to... So I'm a neurologist, so the, the, the patients I see... Uh, tend to be people with chronic illness, mainly conditions like multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, headache, migraine, so on and so on. It's a, it's a myriad of conditions, often chronic. We don't really cure, but we try to manage and mitigate. And um, so, you know, this is not infectious. It's, uh, it is uh, not respiratory and so on. But I think the thing that really concerned me and which really stood out to me as this uh, this whole episode and epidemic was unfolding was just how little thought was being given to what is actually a very large group of people we've heard very eloquently from uh, professor sikora about cancer and heart disease and you know i couldn't agree more but there's there's a, m over two million people in england with chronic disease now, asthma, diabetes are the most uh, well-known, but neurological disease is, is hugely common, affects all ages. And this is a group of people, in addition, who are quite often disabled. So they are even more reliant, if you like, on trying, being facilitated to leave their home, having group therapies, seeing community rehabilitation, physiotherapy, uh, go into exercise classes and uh, and relying on uh, uh, community nurses and other members of primary care and almost within an instant when lockdown happened that was taken away and there was no i didn't see any consideration given to that large group of people 
And I, I felt no one was really making people aware of this. Now, clearly, there was very good reason to lock down in the sense of we wanted to do something to prevent infection. But it seemed that the actions and the advice that was being given was looking almost solely at one part of the equation and ignoring other very big parts of the, the whole equation, that is healthcare delivery. And I, I, regrettably, I think it's still going on. And so what's the um, quality of life been like for your patients, would you say? Because, I mean, as you said, they, they very much rely on things like physiotherapy, face-to-face -face treatment, um, and if that's been denied, what, they've just literally been abandoned? They've just been left at home? And how can you treat yourself with conditions like that? You can't. Well, so there's, there's, there's multiple aspects to care, but a large group of people with neurological disorders, the, the treatment is multidisciplinary and it's symptom management. We haven't got a, a, an antibiotic or a vaccine that can take these things away. Now, as a specialist in a hospital or on the end of a telephone, in terms of the, the virtual delivery of care, I can contact people and ask how they are, and I can ask them, you know, have they got new symptoms and how they're managing with their medicines and so on. But, you know, it, it, they are, their quality of life has diminished drastically. So I can find out if their neurological condition is active or not, but I can't give them quality of life because so many of their support structures that were in there giving quality of life have disappeared. Remember also that people with chronic disease are more likely to live on their own. They're more likely to be, have uh, lower incomes, so they're in smaller accommodations, less likely to have gardens, not able to enjoy the sun that was around in spring and you know, enjoying lockdown in our gardens. They had none of that. And uh, you know, they, were, uh, they were slowly and slowly getting worse in terms of their neurological disorders. So for instance, um, uh, people I see with multiple sclerosis, very prone with inactivity or reduced physio and input to, for their muscles to get stiffer, to get increased pain and spasms. And you know, th for what could be vital degrees of uh, movement to keep their lives active and going, all put at risk for uh, obviously a very serious and very important infection. But as I say, it seemed that all the focus was on infection prevention and nothing was being given to this large group of people's quality of life in the process. So how do you um, estimate um, or try and, and quantify um, the impact that the lockdown has had on the nation's mental health? So, you know, um, I, hope, I hope there are... This is happening. I hope that psychiatrists and the, the Royal College are, are doing assessments on this. It, it's very, very hard. You've got to remember the context of this in that uh, the mental health within the UK was dramatically falling anyway before this was happening. You know, uh, I'm sure no one would disagree on the panel that uh, there was a, an increasing uh, in mental health problems within the UK, younger and younger people, wider and wider use of medications and so on. Now, as has been you know, already said, and I completely agree, you've had almost 24 hour constant fear from our broadcast news. We are almost living in a state of permanent fear and crisis. And can you imagine how that impacts on someone, particularly if they're already vulnerable or feel vulnerable from an illness point of view, and uh, their roots in terms of getting help in terms of either their community uh, network of care or going to a hospital is now either gone or seems incredibly dangerous. You know, um, you're another outspoken voice on social media and I saw you had a, you had a lovely pop at Lewis Goodall um, from Newsnight the other evening because again, back to one of the concurrent themes tonight of the sense of terror being struck into the public by the media. Um, they did a, an item about we should have gone into lockdown a week earlier. And you said we shouldn't have gone into lockdown at all, didn't you? Um, so it wasn't a pop at Lewis. I don't know Lewis, and I'm sure he's a very, very yes. nice guy. <laughs> so it wasn't, it was, uh, it was more um, uh, the framing. Um, so I, when, and I, I have to say, I don't watch a great deal of uh, uh, BBC News or 
any of the other main channel news because the framing is always this it's it's about process rather than the big questions so there's very little discussion about actually is lockdown a good idea or not it's more well should we have done it earlier and so you know you're, you're asking the wrong question in my opinion because and there's a, i think there's a really big danger here because if we are seeing a spike in cases, and I, I agree with what's been said before, I don't think we're going to see a second wave in its proper definition, but we may see a spike in cases, and there's several reasons why we may see that, then the temptation is to just to repeat the cycle and do it all again and inflict more harm. So there's got to be a proper discussion about the actions and, and whether they were sensible or not. Okay, we've heard lots of conflicting opinions, even on this one show tonight, about the effectiveness of masks so I've been asking every guest on tonight's Unlocked their opinions on masks. So which camp are you in, to mask or not to mask? Okay, um, no is the answer, but I, I think um, I, there's a lot of subtlety here. So there's, there's masks and there's face masks and there's face cloths and so on. So properly surgical, medical standard, well-fitted face masks in the right environment, I think are very, very important. When I go to hospital now where I work, I wear a mask. I'm, in, I'm wearing a mask pretty much all the time in hospital. You know, one could argue the pros and cons of it, but you know, it's not an unreasonable thing to do. It, we're in a medical environment. I'm wearing a medical standard mask. It's fitted properly and so on. You know, I'm sure I'm making sure I'm keeping it clean and, and so on. So I can see the logic there, but we, we've become uh, we've become trying to normalize something which, as we've just heard, there is no evidence for. Mm. So, um, for instance, um, you, you, people have looked at face cloths. Now, I consider a face mask to be a medical device, and a medical device needs proper evidence proof to normalize its use. Now, I'm not saying people shouldn't wear it. If they want to wear it, that's absolutely fine. It's the compulsion issue, particularly when, and I've seen this so much, they're saying, well, look, you know, it may help and there's no, there's no problem. Why, why, you, why you say no? But people are forgetting that there are downsides to this. They just don't see the downsides because they feel personally, and that's fine, that there's no downside for them personally. But there is a downside to this. So, I mean, putting aside, and we can argue about risks of reinfection and lowering oxygen rates with face cloths and so on, and, you know, touching it and making them dirty. But again, the conversation that just isn't ha happening is and this goes along with the fear someone who's vulnerable is in a climate of fear already goes outside and there's masks everywhere this is not how we can move society forward and i heard that you know um, dr cannon quite reasonably suggesting well masks could be a way to normalization i actually think it's the opposite and you've got to look at what happened in japan and the far east so i've, I've seen this in a number of uh, other you know people saying that you know uh, in the Far East, that masks are normal, low infections, whatever it may be, you, know, you can argue about the figures. But this is how the normalization of face masks came in the Far East. It didn't happen by magic or overnight. It happened because of a gradual normalization over time in a response without evidence to infection. And if people think, and I, I you know, I do think this, if people think that donning a mask now or not a mask but a face cloth now is going to be a temporary thing which will never happen again and lead us out of lockdown in a few months they're mistaken this is going to be a normalization of activity there are going to be more infections coming maybe not covid maybe further covid other respiratory viruses uh, masks uh, or face masks or face cloths will become normalized if we are if we do this now without proper evidence Okay, we're getting a lot of um, comments from Facebook here. Um, Dr. John Lee, a um, couple of questions for you. Cause some people came in a little bit late and they missed your part. They wanted your take on masks. We've heard a lot of information tonight of conflicting nature. What's your position on masks? Are they worthwhile or are they pointless? I think they're largely pointless. Um, they, there's no evidence to support their use outside of a healthcare setting. The evidence is pretty weak inside a healthcare setting, but I mean, I, I think we can all see why surgeons having, you know, uh, 
been wearing masks for the last 100 years aren't going to stop wearing masks now. But the fact is the evidence is pretty weak inside a healthcare setting. One or two of the few studies that have been done on face masks in surgical settings have shown a reduction in wound infections when people don't wear them. I mean, anyway, it's, it's weak evidence. I think the evidence in a public setting uh, of all different things is essentially non-existent. This is why the one of the Royal Society reports that came out recently was busy trying to argue that too much ev too much weight had been put on evidence-based medicine uh, because there isn't any good evidence from evidence-based medicine and so they wanted to use sort of arm-waving evidence to uh, support the use of face masks. I, I completely agree with the comments of Dr Rashid that he just made now. The fact is we should never be compelled to do anything without a strong evidential base for it because whatever that thing may be whether it's masks or anything else it has the risk of doing much more harm than the harms it's supposed to be avoiding um, and also it says something about the society we, we want to live in you know, do we want to live in a totalitarian society where we can be compelled to do things where there is no good evidence for the fact that they that they work um, I know what I think about that and I think people should think very carefully uh, about this issue I'm surprised actually at how relatively little noise we've heard from the British public about uh, you know personal freedoms and civil rights. Uh, we've had huge sweeping changes to, to our freedoms over the last few months on the basis of very very weak evidence um, and the fact is as I say good intentions are not enough for this. You can't just say oh well we may be helping other people um, uh, so we should do it because my argument would be well we may not be helping other people we may be harming them so we shouldn't do it. The bottom line is by all means give people the evidence but if you don't have actual you know, convincing evidence that something should be done, it should not be compelled. It should be suggested, could be encouraged, but not compelled. We should not go down that route. But isn't the trouble now uh, that all these debates ha have absolutely zero nuance? Um, you are painted as a quack, as selfish, as evil, as hating the NHS if you choose not to wear a mask, whereas you are seen as virtuous and pious and doing the great thing for the greater good if you choose to wear one based on no real evidence, based on a political, not a medical decision. Well, we live in a postmodern age, and I think what this whole episode has shown us is that science counts for nothing. Uh, I mean, I, I've been shocked. I mean, my only, my only motivation for writing the articles that I've written is not to kickstart a second uh, career in journalism and my retirement. My only motivation for it was to try and speak truth to power and maybe to change the narrative and maybe to stop some of these crazy things that have been happening sooner. And I would say in that sense, they've been a complete failure. I think the the government has picked its narrative, it's picked its chosen advisors, they've picked their narrative, and they simply don't care what anybody else thinks, what any evidence there might be, they're simply going to peddle this narrative forever. And I find that exceptionally worrying. I, it makes me wonder, you know, what we can do to actually live in a rational society. I mean, people tell us we live in a rational society in a scientific age. I think this episode absolutely demonstrates we do not. Wow. Professor Sikora, can we come back to you? Um, we're very privileged to still have you here. I thought you had to back <laughs> off. Well, anything, anything you've heard this evening, you've, you've been sitting there nodding along feverishly, anything you've heard <laughs> you'd like to comment on? Well, it's, it's a fascinating debate, really, to hear us all talking like this. And I think the measure of agreement is astounding. I mean, you know, masks, I'm, I'm complete disquiet about the whole thing and, and the civil liberties involved in the uh, infringement of them on, on the basis of scanty evidence. But I think it is something to do with something I said earlier. It's the incompetence of the politicians to make to assess science in a rational way. Sure, you can have 40 advisors on your sage and your uh, orthodox sage or non-orthodox sage or biosecurity people. Uh, you can have all that. But group speak, I mean, you, we all know how NHS committees work. Uh, they just go on and on and nothing gets achieved other than some document that comes out and very little implementation of any value. And, uh, you know, to try and get consensus if you've got 40 advisors is almost impossible. If you just took one thing, should we wear masks on railways? And you get 40 advisors, I'm sure there's complete conflict about it. Uh, and uh, so in the end, they did a majority vote and the answer was yes. So we were told we have to wear masks and the law was changed to allow us to do that, to, to allow the politicians to, to make that decision. So I think that's the whole problem of how we get out of here and move forward. 
Uh, other countries have done it much better in the sense they've had somehow more dynamic leadership. I mean, small countries, I'm mean, Belgium, for example, dynamic prime minister, relatively young lady, and she just came up with a plan for getting out. Lockdown came, and then she came up with a plan sanctioned by her little committee, and it just moved along. Now, there's a little increase. It'll be interesting to see in Antwerp what they're going to do about that. But she seems to have got it under control. I mean, it's that dynamic leadership that we sort of lacked here. Uh, and it's, it's without being personal about Boris and the fact he got COVID or something, he certainly got admitted to St. Thomas's Hospital with great excitement. Uh, you know, how it's all going to end up here, I think it will gradually... Christmas is not a bad end point for this. And, uh, as you know, the, the NHS has got this crazy plan that I've seen, but no one can give me the evidence that there's going to be a, a September to November second wave of some magnitude uh, followed by winter illnesses, uh, influenza. And th this plan was talked about three months ago. And when I asked people, well, show me the plan, give it me, they couldn't give it me. The next thing you know is the Academy of Medical Sciences a week ago produced 120,000 deaths. And it's, it's like the ghost of Neil Ferguson coming forward at the end of the, uh, as we go into summer. And I think, you know, you end up not reading this stuff. And as a practicing oncologist, I think if we don't get on and treat cancer and, you know, Wakar as a, as, a, as a practicing neurologist, the same thing. His patients have disappeared. My patients have disappeared. And they've got, they're, they're, they're there somewhere. Uh, John Lee's patients, well, they're, many of them will be dead. So it's not so important for him. But uh, patients have disappeared. They're not getting value from the NHS. And whatever the reason, we've got to get that value back for them. We've had literally hundreds of comments coming in, especially during this, this spinal furlong. It's really picked up. Rita Miller wants to thank Dr. Lee, Dr. Rashid, and Professor Sakura and Dr. Jefferson. We need to get more messages like this out and get rid of the fear. Uh, Mark Miller says we need this show on mainstream media every night. Thank you, the checks in the post. Um, it has been <laughs> a great debate, though. You know, this, this, I think this is what people want. They want more expansive debate where people are allowed to violently agree, violent, violently disagree. But also, looking through tonight's notes, I've been jotting down as I go along to try and sum up this show at the end, and it's astonishing, some of the stuff that's been coming out. Political incompetence, brainwashing, incompetence of the highest order. We cannot criticise the NHS. It's like the new Church of England. Fear is particular to Britain. There is no evidence. There's been a complete failure, largely pointless. We live in a totalitarian society where, where science counts for nothing. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't hear that kind of stuff on the BBC or Sky News or anywhere else. So thank you for being so frank and open and honest. It's a hugely refreshing change on tonight's episode of Unlocked. I'm going to wrap things up now. I feel especially privileged and thankful, Professor Sakura, you stuck around, um, didn't get tempted to go off and water your tomatoes. Maybe later, because um, I, want to, I want to make mine bigger than yours. I'm using extra tomorite from tomorrow onwards. Okay, I want to wrap up tonight's show now uh, just by saying um, Unlocked will be taking uh, the next month off doing live shows. But we do have some superb interviews. We had a, an interview with Simon Dolan, the founder of Keep Britain Free, who's become another very outspoken um, voice around the pandemic, and much akin to Professor Sakura. We had that. Uh, we did another one with Claudia Webb, the MP for Leicester East. She came on the show after Andrew Bridgen, the Conservative MP for Leicester North West, uh, was very critical of the illegal slave trade in Leicester. Uh, that he called it a cancer at the heart of British society that put a stain across the whole city of Leicester, talks about political incompetence and ineptitude in the city and the fear of being called racist from that, that, that problem being tackled. And lo and behold, we're now looking at similar situations emerging across Oldham and Blackburn. Again, we're not afraid to have those conversations here on Unlocked. We'll also have an interview with former Brexit Party MEP, friend of mine, and media commentator extraordinaire, Claire Fox. But look, 
The community out there tonight has been firing off messages endlessly, mostly of support. Please keep those comments coming. The show will be on YouTube from tomorrow morning, as will every future episode. If you like what we're doing, then you can donate. Um, we'll take payment in any currency, including beer. The whole show will be out there tomorrow. But, but I want to round off tonight to all of our guests who've been absolutely stellar and first rate. Thank you, guys. And thank you all for tuning in. And we'll see you again on a future episode of Unlocked in September onwards. Thank you for tuning in.